and for me, I see you just hit record. Do you want to do a little hello again? No, we'll be okay, fine. Okay, cool. We'll figure it out. Yeah, for me, I mean, we're in a, a pretty amazing age. It's a certainly a double-edged sword, this age of, you know, increasing technology with all the naughty ways that seem to come along with that. But also, you know, when we're stewards of the technology and aware of, you know, this creation and, and to be you know, conscious parents of it, I think, then we um, open to opportunities to see more um, of the world than our eyes themselves allow. You know, that in many ways feels very Uranian to speak astrologically because Uranus, who was discovered really rather as a freak accident with a telescope in 1781, you know, then kind of shattered this old world view and allowed us to start seeing beyond you know the limits of our senses in that regard and of course astrology when it's done right when astrology is a way in instead of a way out it is that it is that tool so but it can go both ways and so the um the software like being able to look at astronomy software um next to a chart can be really helpful there's a really wonderful I'll name a couple of them there's a couple um, places online i would recommend people go to play in that regard one is solar system scope and uh, solarsystemscope.com is a place where you can see a heliocentric or sun-centered model of the solar system for any time. So you can check out your birth chart from that regard, you know, with that, the way that we learn the planets, there's the sun and then Mercury and Venus and Earth and that, you know. So that's a cool thing to see. And then I think even more so, like I'm really interested in having a look at the planets from space, but that's not where I live, you know. I'm so I'm really about putting my feet on the ground and kind of instead of like narrowing my gaze through some little lens which seems to be the way of modern astronomy like the ancient way is opening our gaze you know like really seeing all of the sky and seeing the way that the heavens and the earth are married and see how that that marriage like dances you know and see how it's seen from many different places on earth when you travel around the sky changes significantly in some ways and doesn't change at all in others and coming to terms with that like helps us have more of a global view but just that idea of being able to go outside and and have a look at the sky and be able to see the chart there then being able to look at the chart and see the sky there that's bridging a gap that's been here for thousands of years and there are like some technologies that help with this, there's another software I was going to recommend, which is called Stellarium, which is like Stellar and Planetarium combined. And it's free for Mac and PC. It's awesome. Um, Stellarium.org is the place to get that. It's a pretty significant learning curve because it's a big piece of software, you know, but um, there's also you'll find on YouTube, you'll find six hours of Stellarium for astrologers training by yours truly. Um, and it's cool because we can start then seeing what I see outside, cast on the screen, kind of narrow our gaze into little places, put a chart next to it. And so I was like, oh, okay. But I mean, the chart itself is a technology. And in the Northern Hemisphere, you can take a chart wheel and generally face south, and it's just showing you what the planets are doing right there. And if you know where the stars align on the chart, you get to see a lot of that too. So it's pretty cool in our day and age where you can touch a button and suddenly somebody's birth chart's printed out for you. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think that's a great gift. I don't think that you have to know the sky to be a great astrologer, but, or to make advancements in astrology at all. But if you want to be like a embodied astrologer, right? If you want these things to be more than just symbols, uh, than going out and experiencing Venus in the evening sky and honoring her as a being, you know, going out and watching the moon wax and wane and do her thing, you know, and her dance <laughs> from Earth's point of view with the sun. And then seeing that in the chart, then when I see a chart of somebody, I know what that moon looks like, you know. I know what Venus looks like when she's that far from the sun when I see that in the chart. And there's just something more intimate because what we call astrology today is actually really correspondences. Hmm. And the ancients knew that astrology was twofold. It was the kind of measurable heavenly happenings. That's astronomy, right? I can take a ruler to Jupiter and Saturn in the morning right now and show you because of what stars are aligned to where they are in the Zodiac and all that. And that's great. But how does that dance me? 
versus how does that dance you? That's correspondences. And astrology is the rainbow bridge, the sacred science, the high art that exists between those two, the, the measurable heavenly happenings and the immeasurable. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this, this is my favorite example. Like, Right, so like that flute could be mathematically measured. There were frequencies and amplitudes and space and all that, you know, rhythm. Now, did you dig it? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I can't say that with my ruler, right? But the great high art of musical harmony, which is a sister science to astrology in, in the old ways, we know this. Um, like that can help me know, you know, does it, uh, is this person more likely to, to dig a major chord or a minor chord or whatever, you know? And so astrology is really the highest developed of these, but the more I feel that we can intimately understand and experience, very importantly, experience like the measurable thing, the more I think we will have an intimate um, understanding of and therefore expression of the immeasurable bit, the, the correspondences. So that's my general gig and my, my general devotion is to remind astrologers to look up. Um, I'm right now, I'm teaching a, a month long course for the organization for professional astrology that's astronomy for astrologers which i love is now part of their certification for opa um, and soon a similar course will be found at geminibrett.com a web course um, just like really easy simple things that like hey this is the chart this is the sky but more importantly you know sentient embodied practices go outside Put a stick in the ground look at the midday shadow that points on the meridian use that shadow at night to see the midheaven yes you can see it in space with your face you know where is the ascendant like learning to see the houses and uh, in a way because we back in the day could not touch a button right? right we had to go out there and see the moment to be able to speak of the moment we were more connected as human beings, I would say, through, through the ways of our craft. And our craft in that way was also then more connected to the human, the, the, the natural experience. Sure. And a couple thousand years ago, like sky gazing, sky based astrology, like was able to die because the ephemerides, the tables of planetary emplacements and houses and that, like started to get good enough that you no longer needed to do it. You just needed to know what time it was, you know? Um, yeah. And, we're certainly like further along in that adventure. Like you and I have softwares that can do so much, but what if we take it in the ancient way too? And the last thing I'll say before I drink some tea and listen is um, astronomy itself, like for astrologers today, it's like, so what? Like the astronomers do all that. All we need is the tables. Like all I need is whatever's going into my software and I don't have to even care what it is so that when I push a button, I know what somebody's birth chart is and now I can help them feel and heal and know and grow and that's frankly what i'm in it for right but the other part of this is as um astronomers in our day and age and i don't want to be too general but generally speaking have leaned towards the rationalist towards the you know as all science has and they've narrowed their view and looked far and long away which is cool some fun information's coming through but they're losing the old connection mm -hmm. to how the sun moves during the course. You know, we built stone circles and pyramids all over the world to cement this beautiful mm, relationship of the heavens and the sky, like to bring the above down to the below and anchor that energy on earth. And astronomers today are so far removed from what i like to call sacred astronomy like how we actually experience the movement of the sky from earth that they now don't even understand like what the astrologer's zodiac is which is really simple astronomy so they it tends to be it's a weird thing right now we're living in an age where you know for the most part astronomers think that astrology is what you read in cosmo and for some reason, the astrologers in Cosmo, at least some of the articles, like, are referring to NASA when it comes to what the Zodiac should be. Like, why would you ask a government organization that is vehemently against the very idea of <laughs> astrology to define your Zodiac for you, right? So I think, you know, my, my principal devotion is just to connect these three. Hey, look up, see what you see. And the other piece of that is when you do, 
now you're going to receive in your own symbolic language. Now you're going to receive direct transmissions from the heavenly happenings. And so we in this way are more deeply connecting to the roots of the rules and the proofs of the equations that we use. So we can be translators of the celestial conversation, right? And not just regurgitate like these equations that we've put together through our learning over time. Yeah, makes a lot of sense to me. I know that in the last couple of years, I've been able to be more sky bound and step outside and look and see what is around me for those experiences. Because like you were saying in the rational point, you can walk from point A to point B, but what happens in the middle of the journey is kind of the story that I'm a lot more connected to because anybody can have a new event come into their life, but are you prepared for that? Are kind of the questions or how do I even interpret that in some through someone else's lens that they're going to understand based on their chart. But it definitely, I can say that my practice got significantly different when I was able to get more skybound. So if you're out there, you're watching, you're listening and you're studying and you're loving it. If you're at a beginning place and you are just still trying to memorize what goes where, enjoy that as well. There's no push. There's no necessarily right timing to get more skybound. But when you do, there is a depth that comes to it, to being able to breathe in. I was watching um, Venus, like, what was it, a month ago? And just under that, just really, and my plant, my chart is loaded with Venus energy, and it just felt like a homecoming, you know, which is a different experience than just knowing that I have a heavy Venus chart or that you have a heavy whatever. It's beautiful to see and be a part of the dance. Because the other part is coming into heavy Uranian energy is remembering to stay human, practice human, be human. But how do we do that? when we do have the sense of ease and comfort that comes with just creating the chart at cafe astrology and moving on, that's not, it's not the same thing. Love you cafe astrology, but it's not the same thing. There's a depth and a weight I think that comes with seeing that we're a part of the scheme of what we're looking at as well. What happened in your life that opened up more of a sky experience for me? Um, honestly, funny enough, I uh, was just outside. That's it. I was just outside. And for me, typically the clairs are open and on and work relatively well most of the time. And it was just that moment. And I was feet on the ground, just there and went, oh, I should look up. Yeah. I mean, I remember, and actually it wasn't that long ago, my entire astrological cosmology changed. Um, just because one night I was out looking at the moon, I was like, huh, that's sunlight. Right. <laughs> Which is like so <laughs> obvious and we know that and we learned that, you know, <laughs> since we were kids and stuff, you know. But sometimes those things just drop in or like, I mean, the first time I watched a solar eclipse since I got hip to astrology, you know, I saw some when I was a kid, but then there was a, there was a day, it was very close to my birthday in October, and I was out in my backyard, and I just watched, it was a partial solar eclipse, and it's like, oh, the moon is much closer to Earth than the sun, and I just saw it, yeah. you know, and yeah. there, I, I'd always known that, and of course we know that, and you can tell that simply by the truth that the moon speeds around the wheel a lot faster than the sun does, but to actually have a physical experience of that, it really started changing the way that I am taught eclipses and the way that I teach mm -hmm. eclipses, you know, and then yeah, open this whole new world. Yeah, um, I get it. So yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's cool. I mean, it's, uh, I, I can't, like, I can't even believe I never saw <laughs> Venus or never knew I was seeing Venus until right. some years ago. Right. Yeah. Cause like, if you go look at Venus as we're recording this in May of 2020, go look at her after the sunset West right now. And it's like blinding Venus is actually the most commonly um, false UFO report. <laughs> right? Because you'd look at Venus as like, Oh my gosh, what is that angel spaceship flying straight from my right. eyeball? But the weirdest thing to me is how did I never notice that mm -hmm. before? Yeah. And or even, you know, like more as I like become, I guess, more and more of a naturalist and I'm out hiking in the middle of the night, being with the stars. And I mean, there's some nights like hiking in, in Sedona with just full moon, silver everywhere, 
right? And you like, there's no worries about if there's rattlesnakes or whatever, any more than there is during the day. In fact, at night, you're more cool in that regard. But you can see where you're going. You're not going to step on a cacti or something because the moon just lights it up because that time when she, her full mirror is alive, right? At full moon time. And, like, I just never really noticed yeah. that when I was like, I grew up in Vegas. You know? it was like <laughs> the sure. ultimate criminal light pollution realm <laughs> was like this, the soils from which I come. And, um, and so that just that experience alone, it's like, oh my gosh. And then being out a couple of weeks later at new moon time, yeah. and you cannot see a thing, you know? And it's like, wow, imagine when, and it wasn't long ago, imagine before street lamps. Yeah. It Imagine changes. how much more we were connected to this, like by necessity. You it, know? it changes everything, I think. And the best part is that I'm not from Vegas. Like I've been here, we've got the hiking, we've got the everything. But I think until a person is just in that correct position where the door clicks open, you can just miss it. And also, if no one's really making it very aware right like they're not making you aware that there's another way to see this or to experience this so that's you know information is still significantly powerful today but it's exactly like i remember kind of after that experience then talking about in my next video the uh, moon cycles that we were going to experience for the month and having people comment they're like something happened to you that explanation is completely different than you've mm. ever put out and it is it is so neat it is so cool to see it so Yay for going I want to read a few of my homework assignments I just posted for my students. Does that sound okay? Yes. Oh my gosh. I think it would be homework. fun things for everybody to do. Okay, good. Um, one is build a super simple sundial. We're actually going to skip that one because, although, actually, no, put a stick in the ground, y'all. <laughs> like, literally. <laughs> This is one of the reasons why we build Herms for Hermes, you know, when you stack stones. I had this experience a few years back. Um, and I was lost in Joshua Tree because of some idiotic moves, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and I was just out, I climbed up this hill and everywhere I could look, it was just endless, you know, Joshua Tree zone. And I was terrified because I didn't have much water with me, I had like a windbreaker, I had nothing to really make it through the cold of the desert night. And it was just like idiot. But I, so I got really scared, you know, but so that's when I call in the wayfinder, right? Mercury. Mm -hmm. And so there's an old practice of building herms. And it was really cool to do that in that moment because I realized that just stacking stones, because it's not easy to balance stones on each other, right? Um, it forces you to like, just do that. And when you're just there, you're not in your fear. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's kind of, you can kind of come back into that presence of the moment, which is where symbol speaks, you know? Mm -hmm. And then in that place, I remember, usually I would call the crows, like a really good guide for me. But I just spoke blackbird, blackbird, and this bird came through this blackbird. It was a magpie, I think. And it just flew in the direction where I had been heading, which I like judged based upon the direction of my shadow and these things that I teach and that I learn, right? But it was like such a powerful moment. And I realized then like, Building Herms for Hermes, yes, because it slows you down like that, but also because it's the most rudimentary sundial ever. <laughs> Just like a, a something standing straight. And the cool thing is, as the sun gets higher in the day, right, moving from the east to the west sky, at its highest height, and for you astrologers, that's the sun at the midheaven, the highest sun of the day. That shadow will, will point either north or south, depending on which hemisphere you're looking at. And so for one of these assignments, it's just put a stick in the ground, work with that midday shadow, the shortest shadow of the day. And then when you work on that shadow line at night, which in the Northern Hemisphere will point to the North Star in one direction, in the other direction, it points to the astrological midheaven. So if you start to get to know your planets or your signs, like I can tell you if I'm outside and um, I see Jupiter on that line, it's like, oh, Jupiter is at the midheaven right now. Sure. Which I'm not seeing right now because of his proximity to the sun. Okay, so there's one. Another is sit with a direction. And this is, this is part of the point of creating a, a sundial to so know the north-south. Now we know the east-west. And this is a really beautiful practice. Like you bring blankets and some tea, maybe some company, and you just give yourself to the east for the night. 
-hmm. go out like an hour after sunset when the stars are starting to say hello and just introduce yourself you know hello east i'm brett i hear you're the east and will you be my teacher and you just sit like four hours four to six if you can um and you just watch what the east does and then another night you go watch what the south does Right. And then the commitment is, look, they could land a spaceship in like the, the Northwest. Over there, and I'm not going like I'm with you tonight, South, you know, yeah. and then just dig it. And it's so amazing how the directions come to speak to you. And, and what I found in my own quest at this point anyway, is that like so many shamanic systems throughout global wisdom traditions, the tropical zodiac is a system based upon the energies of the cardinal directions mm -hmm. so as we tune into those energies and this kind of comes to part three and four right here um we don't tell them what they are because i've learned for very fortunately i was taught by some like lakota elders in, in, in my oh. life about the directions and shipibo elders in peru and it's a very different scene down there and it should be because they're in another hemisphere where their sure, sure. south is like our north and opposite you know but i don't want to go tell the east what it is and try to understand right so one of these homework assignments is go drink a bunch of venus in the evening west right now right like soon venus will not be an evening star anymore and she won't be back in the sunset sky until about a year later and so dig her while you can because soon it's going to be wake up before the sun if you want to get a, get a oh drink God. of the goddess you know and try and this is a hard one for astrologers try not to tell her what she is try not to go out there and say oh you're a gemini venus square pisces neptune and you are about to station retrograde did you know you're slow did you know you're out of bounds right now you have crazy north declination venus you know and so we have so much to say to a planet because we're so like educated and turned on to these many things that it's hard to listen Sure. Right? And uh, we know how that is with people. Like, if you want to tell some person that you're attracted to who they are, they're not going to stick around for long. <laughs> you know, yeah. the same, I think, the planets, like, if we just say, wow, you're beautiful, please tell me about you. And then trust what comes in. And then that's the tricky part, right? Because I have had a few strange experiences where I've actually had planets speak to me in English, or at least, like, was able to just convince myself that I'm not crazy and that's happening, which is a, f f actually a better outcome than just saying, oh my God, I'm crazy, right? So maybe that's why. But typically, these non-human beings like animals, plants, planets, etc., are going to speak to us not in, you know, our common tongue, our spoken tongue, but in some like esoteric vocabulary we've developed like there's a very large and bright and beautiful star that has an ancient name but for me that star is called bob because the first time we ever like really dropped in i clearly heard, heard bob marley's revolution in my head and i have a deep connection to the lyrics of that song to the music of that song like it goes back to i don't know like sophomore year in high school maybe earlier you know and Bob Marley was born on my father's birthday and like all sorts of things, right? And so for me to just have that star inspire the, the, the experience of the song, which is so much more than a song to me, well, now that star becomes that type of energy for me, the way that I delineated astrologically, et cetera. And then fascinatingly, although not that surprisingly, when I go back to the ancient records, though certainly not expressed through Bob Marley's revolution, <laughs> like the ancients, most of them had a very similar thing to say about that star. But that star taught me in, in the, my language. And instead of like knowing that star as Bob is actually more powerful for me in that way than honoring its ancient name, which I also do. And certainly if I'm speaking to a client or in a teaching i'm going to call that star what it's called you know but yeah, yeah. for me it's bob and that's just the gig and that just comes from like going to listen and another thing i'll say about that is we can't do that if we are participating with our programming that says you should be ashamed for not knowing or something like this mm -hmm. 
And that's my most common experience with astrologers when I take them outside, is we have to go through about an, an hour and it lasts for longer, but that's when it's very vocal before I try to help put it in its place. Like an hour of just shaming, self-shaming. Mm -hmm. Oh, I should know these things and I don't. And everyone's out with their iPhone staring around and, you know, and it's like, cool, look, the password to the temple of the sky is wonder. Yeah. Right. And the only way to be in that space of awe and like the, the appropriate, I find like the appropriate way to enter the temple of the sky is to be giggling. And it's so funny because we will never know it all. It is never. like, never, never. Yeah. Endless, Never. universal, <laughs> it's like, right? Yeah. And so just being in that space of like, I can't know this, that's when the knowings drop in. You know, that is that reverence. And there is a nice reverence to not knowing. There's a nice humility to it. You know, I know standing out there and then coming into my practice, having that moment, and it was a moment. It did not have to be six months, but it was a moment of how do I not know this? And the answer is, because I don't know it, right? Like, just because I'm in a field, just because you're in any freaking field does not mean you know absolutely everything that's going on, and you can sit and look like you do, but that you lose the sense of wonder of not just what's outside, but the people and the resources around you, right? Like, immediately, when I was watching you speak when we were working on Astrology Hub, I'm like, oh, he knows the sky. If I want to know the sky, I need to go talk to that person instead of, oh, God, I got to pretend like I know the sky right? The way that you do. And so we cut off this ability to human with each other and still be teachers and learn from all of these different avenues if we have to know everything. So. Yeah, I mean, and when people are saying that, and it's such a common thing, what they're actually saying is, oh my gosh, astrology should know this, right? Mm. And I mean, one amazing thing, like in the quadrivium sciences, which are the sacred sciences, right? So number itself, number in space, which is geometry, number in time, which is musical harmony, and number in space and time, which is astronomy. Like that's the old mystery school approach to our tradition. All of these forces have quantity and quality. Again, like a musical note can be measured in many different spectrums, but that doesn't tell me how it's going to like yeah. sing to my heart right? We, we, we learn that when one, two, three, four, and two is one plus one, right? That's quantity. But if we learn the quality of number, right? If we actually learned like the idea of oneness before we learn two, we could never be told that two is one plus one because right. oneness teaches us this is impossible. And the cool thing about, you know, musical harmony and astrology in a sense is actually we've focused much more on the quality, which is beautiful. It's the goddess, it's the immeasurable, it's the experiential, it's the symbolic, you know, it's the heavenly, it's the night. Um, so, but what about if we add that other thing? So like the greatest musicians I know, for example, they never learned to read music, they right. learned to play. You know, I mean, it said that John Lennon and Paul McCartney never even learned to read. And there's college courses like devoted to how those two and the Beatles like advanced musical harmony. Right. So but the greatest musicians I know, they didn't learn like I did, which was like, this is a G and this is an E and this is a quarter note. And it was just so mechanical. And once I went to go play with musicians, it was like, what do you mean? Like. Have, what do you, what, what do, what's written? You know, I see great classical musicians yeah. still like who can't just play. Like they can like play, like play the beautiful angel's heart through box, you know, concerto or whatever. But if you just take the music away and say, let me hear that instrument, you know, it's like, what song do you want to hear? I don't want to hear a song. Mm -hmm. I want to hear the moment, you know? And yeah. so the greatest musicians I know, like they don't have that block because they just started like just playing, you know, but then they went back later and brought in the quantity of the thing. Not only so when we get together in rehearsal, we can say, yo, this is in G and we're going to go to the four and we you know, which is so much easier than it. It sounds like this and everybody has to sort it out. right? <laughs> um, but also because once you get now into like the mechanics of the thing that opens this other world 
that since you started in that language of the goddess, since you started in that realm of music and, and quality, now this other thing is going to help you advance that appreciation of the happening. And that's like, I, I'm just uh, gifted by this experience again and again of taking great astrologers, helping them ground their practice into kind of a sensual experience of the earth and then watching where their astrology goes from there. And you've had this experience, not with me, but I love hearing it. Like it opens and it opens and it opens. And now it's just like, because your feet are in the soil, right? You are ground enough to the point where more of the kind of heavenly information can come in and come through. And then we start to see other things that you don't really necessarily see on a chart. Yeah, well, and it feels like, um, to me, chart reading anyways sounds like music. Whenever I pull a chart, it immediately sounds like music, you know, and that's just the way that the readings go for me in, in any way. And then so being able to open that and hear the song and be like, oh, okay, well, wait, we get a couple months down the road and we're going to sing, you know, a new song over here or whatever that looks like. But that's just not necessarily like how it all started first it was small music inside of a chart mm -hmm. and i hope whoever if you guys are watching i hope it encourages you if you feel called to read symbols just start the rest of the pathway will present itself but start you know and truly brett is like telling you the truth sometimes we work into this thing in a semi seems backwards kind of way right? We learn the paper and then we learn the sky or some learn the sky and then they come to the paper, whatever it is, the ability to have a really delicious experience in doing this is available. Yeah. And there is no backwards and there is no beginning. That's Truly. like the beautiful truth of cyclical awareness, right? Like every point of the circumference of the circle is the center of the circumference. So wherever you start, you're going to find yourself back to that place just more with more wisdom and you'll be born again, you know, from there. And, and it's actually a spiral, the circle of life. I and want to I show you a picture, people. Stormy. Um, okay. I'm in for some visuals. Well, this is a map that I use um, to like oh, yeah. help my hearing of a chart. Um, and there's been many maps suggested over time. This is different than many of them and, and similar in other ways. But I simply like to tie the key of A to the sign of Aries. Um, others will put C with Aries, but I feel that Aries has to have some sharps. And, and I like this kind of like English language anyway, A and Aries. And it makes C Cancer. And I feel Cancer uh, really speaks to the sign, the C's from which we come. That's like no flats and no sharps, the kind of the beginning, which... We see it the theme of Mundi and other places astrologically too. But basically it just lets me hear the aspects of a chart. Sure. Um, so mm -hmm. I've used it for many years. Like if I'm at like a stumbling place in a session, which happens sometimes, right? Where I'm like trying to like meet this person and, and have them speak the, the story that's going to help me understand like how mm -hmm. the potential of this energy and the nativity played out in their life, you know? And it's just not happening. And so sometimes I'll just like break out. Like I always have a melodica close to where I'm sitting and I'll, and I'll like, and that, that's in my map, that's the sound of a T square. Okay. And then suddenly, boom, blast. Yeah. Like they just, the, the story starts spilling out. Right. Mm -hmm. So I've used this map in this way for a long time, but I've just now started working with a dear friend that we used to play in a band together for many years, Eric Deutsch. who's like, master piano player and i'm um taking astrology charts and i record a video for people of what i'm doing and i focus on a few aspect groups and he's limited to a palette of notes that are the signs that um were occupied by planets at the time of a birth and paying like more emphasis to visible planets into the ascendant so that way like every native has a very unique palette of notes and it's tricky for the musician because i'm going to say hey I want you to like start in the key of B, for example, but you don't get the F sharp, which is in that chord. And Eric's talented enough that he can deal. And so That's then I awesome. give him a few like transmissions of astrology translated to um, harmony. And he gets like notes from me and chords and stuff. And then he just channels like a 12 minute song. That's and so uh, cool. it's fun. It's been a really powerful experience for it's, it's nice. Like, I hesitate to read children's charts mm -hmm. like 
you know, but I love just like offering a song. So it's like, hey, just listen to this a lot. <laughs> you know? Keep listening to this and eventually you'll be 19 and we'll talk again. It'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. That's so yeah, I, I'm like you. I experience charts as music and we're definitely not the first to do so. Are you a yeah. musician? I'm a dance person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that way, and I experience, it's always been that way for me. So it was not a surprise that astrology worked that way either. I experience people as music as well. So that's, you know, a relative in, in my space. So it's not surprising at all that it, it comes through this way. And even outside of astrology, the rest of the spiritual practice I have, it is all in music or in vibrations or in sounds. I was very much so like I was a very stingy laborer because I believe in the vibrational work. And that's, I don't even know if it's safe to say that I believe in these things. This is just a truth. That's it. The world right. works. You just learn to see these realities. Yeah, this is just how it seems to come to me. So that that works. So, oh my gosh. Okay, let's talk about the eclipses. All right. Yeah. Oh man. So we're coming up, and I feel like it's it's like I I don't know why I keep getting this sense of like you know how um when you listen to like the soccer games and they go sabado 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 and they have that. That's how I feel about June and July. I'm like we're just gonna do it and do it and do it. We're gonna eclipse, y'all. It's brilliant quickly i feel like quickly we're going to eclipse quickly yeah well it's always hard to say like how do, how long does an eclipse last for and when does it begin and there's so many different opinions right? sure. um, yeah i've been calling the eclipse that's coming on june 20th the solstice eclipse of 2020 like the most powerful astronomical and therefore astrological event of our lifetimes and then i always follow that well probably second most and that the most was the June solstice eclipse of 2001. And that was, of course, about three months before, the, or two months, two and a half months before the 9-11 happening, which completely changed the world. Yeah. And I mean, and we haven't recovered from it. In fact, I will say it's like the middle point of a thing that this year is coming to complete is always a silly word in our game right but right. to like to extend and to, uh, there's like the point of it is we're starting to 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 have the opportunity to to see but it's really going to require people have a look and not just hide from the shadow sure. um i have to, i personally feel like all this covid-19 and lockdown stuff is like not even the story of this year um yeah which, i think it's a symptom in the year yeah well i mean i think it's a symptom for how we've been living for a long long time i think you'd agree but i don't think it's even the event of this year <laughs> um if when we look back on it um so we'll we'll see about that but like i've been calling this year it's it's funny to say especially for someone not of a religious background but i've been calling this year the second coming um mm -hmm. and that's based upon some like sky alignments and biblical text and prophetic text from many different cultures that really seems to be focused on this time in which we live including the turning of the maya long count calendar in december 21st 2012 uh, i mean i could go on and on in that regard there's celtic transmissions vedic transmissions egyptian transmissions i see it in the um let me show you one kind of interesting place of this stuff actually Sure. And so we're having this eclipse. It's going to be at zero degrees of cancer. Right on the hand of the high man. So if you've got this point, it's just, it's going to be significant for us no matter what's happening. But if you do have um, planets or any of your critical points are at zero degrees, you certainly want to do some taking note for sure. Yeah. And I would say for all human beings, and we all have something really important at that degree of zero cancer, because that is the place where in every moment forever, the North Pole of Earth is leaning. Mm. I mean, the tropical zodiac is tied to this. And this is, I feel, what's really been missing in the way that we teach the zodiac. It's taught seasonally, but the seasons are tied to the directions. Yeah. And Earth's pole always which i like to call the spine of gaia or the sword of our stone or the world tree it leans north and south it defines north and south i'm not talking about the magnets right i'm talking about true north and south in our day and age polaris pole star north star but that changes you know this way 
<laughs> because of this so-called third motion of verse, this, this precessional motion, which describes these giant circles in the sky over 26,000 years. In this time where we are right now, like where that north point is leaning is one of the most powerful places in space, a place that the Lakota called the sacred hoop. And they say it's where our souls come from and where when we die, we will move back through to be purified. It's the Anipi, it's the sweat lodge in the sky. And that's where we're clean so we can walk the spirit road, which is the Milky Way, to a place that sets in the Southwest. And that's the galactic center. And in our day and age, and this is literally once in 26,000 years, this point is leaning towards the galactic cross at the galactic center. And that seemed to be what the Maya were tuning their long count calendar to. Mm -hmm. And this point is leaning towards the center of the sacred hoop, which is a place that the Celts called the hand of the high man, which is Orion's club. Uh, in Bengali, he was known as time man. So we can see some eyes on things that happen there. And I'm just gonna give you a quick look at this in this strange temple um, called the Capitol Building in Washington, DC. We'll go inside. This is a statue of George Washington in the Capitol Rotunda. And he's looking up at himself becoming a god. <laughs> this painting here by Constantine Brumidi, who, by the way, was broken out of Vatican jail to come paint this. Um, There's always it's called a way the out. Oath. <laughs> What's that? There's always a way out. <laughs> right, totally. Yeah, his wife and child weren't released, but he was, which is a trippy story. Anyway, he like painted some churches in New York. It was on the East Coast, and then he painted this, which is called the Apotheosis of George Washington which means George Washington becoming a god. It's a trippy thing. Um, so I went there and unfortunately I was like, at this point, like tuned into there's something more here than just like patriotic, you know, brainwashing. Although I feel like some of that's happening here too. But I came across the work of William Henry, who thinks of this place as a stargate. And I went and kind of respected it that way. And then tuning into it, I received a dream from Hermes that night where he's like, dude, you know those stars that this is. Um, and I realized that it was this sacred hoop of stars. So first, before I do that, you'll see this hexagon of kind of mythic figures. All right, here's Hermes. This is Poseidon and Venus. And here's uh, Pallas Athena with Ben Franklin. You see that rainbow that goes over to Ceres and there's seven figures here, Ceres and, and, and uh, Proserpina, you know them maybe as Demeter and, and Persephone. Um, between in that rainbow is this goddess America, right? Um, but notice how she looks like Orion. Oh yeah. And here is Hephaestus, right? Who makes the chariots and all the weapons and things. And here you have George Washington in full military regalia sitting between these two angels. This would be Gabriel blowing the horn. And then, um, well, I mean, we could just get into the number magic. This is E Pluribus Unum, right? Um, and this is the image. So the astronomers know this place of space as the winter hexagon. And it consists of these stars, Capella, Castor and Pollux, Procyon, the little dog, Sirius, the big dog, Aldebaran, the eye of the bull. For the Lakota, for the sacred hoop, they use the Pleiades, which are here, and then Regal, which is the foot of Orion. Mm. And this aligns like mostly geometrically and then also very much mythically, like Ariga, the charioteer, like, you know, this is the, this is like the chariot builder. Um, Mercury starring as the Gemini twins here. Procyon, the little dog for Neptune and Sirius, the big dog for Athena because she won the competition for which the city Athens was named. And that rainbow bridge is the Milky Way, which runs from Sirius to Aldebaran. And here we have Ceres, Aldebaran, the bull, right? So this is some time ago aligned to the sign of Taurus. And these seven figures, I think, are meant to represent the seven sisters that Pleiades sits on the bull's back, right? And so importantly, you have Orion, you have Washington like sitting on Orion's club. And really, really importantly, there's 72 stars here on the background of this thing. I'm gonna um, just kind of 
let people read to themselves about the amazing synchronicities with the number 72, like in biology and science and geometry and the spiritual tradition. Um, I maybe need to exit out of this. Well, we'll just let it go. <laughs> I know we don't have too much time, but I want to get to the slide that most matters. And I'll just say it as, as we're walking our way there, this precession of the equinoxes, which basically, again, it's because while we have our daily motion, which is Earth spin, and that's the planets through the houses, and we have our yearly motion, which is Earth's orbit of the sun, and that's the sun through the signs, we also have this tertiary motion, this third motion, which is Earth tracing these great circles in the heavens. And so, like the north point changes where it's pointing in space. It, um, it doesn't change like unless we get hit by a comet again or something like north on your street is north, right? But where earth north is pointing to in the heavens, which is just where her pole points, that changes with the great year. The so-called um, platonic year or great year is about 25,920 years long, that's the ancient consideration, based upon the idea that it takes 72 years for a precession to move the directions, and that's the cardinal signs, through the constellations by one degree. So 72 years times one degree equals about 26,000 years is what we usually teach. NASA is currently working like 25,700 17 or something like that. It's actually kind of seems to be closer to the Maya number, but this is the old prophetic number as we say. And this also arranged for a so-called astrological age, which we track with the east point moving through the constellations, like the east point zero Aries now directed towards the fishes constellation would suggest that we are in the age of the fish. And there's a lot of challenge in trying to determine when the age of Aquarius will begin. Yeah. But um, the north point is very clearly pointing. This is kind of the image of procession. I have to go to a different um, presentation here to show kind of the reveal of this thing. Here we go. The north point in our day and age is pointing to Orion's Club. So it's right in the middle of this winter hexagon. And here you can see actually the Stellarium software offers um, images from different cultures, which is really cool. And when you turn on Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, it shows you the sacred hoop moving wow. through those same stars. So this is a Stellarium picture, uh, and thanks to Stellarium software, they're amazing, of this coming annular ring of fire solar eclipse that's on the hand of the high man Orion, right? So that's like right where George Washington is sitting in that painting, right? The story, I've, I've, if we can tell, is like much deeper than that before and after. That's gonna actually be the subject of my coming presentation for NORWAC. And I really encourage people to check out NORWAC. It's my favorite conference of the year. And this year we can't go, which means more people can go, right? So. Great speakers at NORWAC. Check them out at, I think it's nor N-O-R-W-A-C.net, I think is where NORWAC is. Are you speaking there? I am not. Yeah, it's, have you been to NORWAC before? I have not. It's a good one. When we're allowed to get move around again and stuff, speak, yeah. apply for fun. NORWAC. We'd love to have you speak there. And it's an amazing, like Laura Nalbandian puts on, it's a really great gathering of astrologers in Seattle. Um, yeah. I was excited because this is my, this is supposed to be my coming out, moving around year. And I'm like, well, I was just kidding. I'll just stay here and invite everybody to my cyber house. How about what that? What determined the coming out, moving <laughs> around? Uh, it's time. I gotcha. So it's not like an astrological thing? No, it is, it, it is simply time. Right on. Hiding from our industry for a while. I've been out getting my feet and doing the thing and doing that. And I said, you know what? It's time for me to go meet the rest of the peoples. And, you know, as soon as I made the decision to do that, uh, people came and found me and then I went and found them. And that is the way that it works. You know, all we need to do is have a, ask a, for a little bit of help sometime. And I for think sure. Or just say, or just say, now it's my time. 
Yeah. Right? Well, I, mean, I have tried that thing, one. And the universe is like, it's not your time. Be quiet. Not yet. And I'm like, okay, just right. Wait. Well, then, <laughs> then on my side, we could say, but then, but did you mean it? Right. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think the general rule is that um, the more we are willing to see mystery, the more we make ourselves available for mystery to see. I and when that conversation opens up, right, and that, um, it, that to keep clarity in that conversation is one of the challenges for me because we still have to live in our, like, practice and be, you know, in our mm -hmm. purity in a way. Um, but sure. when you get to that place where it's like, oh, now's the time, this is the, ins the directive, and then it's confirmed. But then we also were astrologers, and so we do know there is a sacred timeline. Right. So like this year, I'm in a ninth house perfection, which tends to be a year of travel. I mean, last year I went, toured around, taught in Mexico twice, was walking and climbed the Great Pyramid <laughs> of the Magician, went to the Great Pyramid in Egypt for the first time, went all over Egypt, like Turkey, Athens, for, you know, sure. it was like, and some of that was in this ninth house year, but this year I was really stoked to like see what's going to, you know, where the winds would carry me. And then it's just like, yeah, but we know that the ninth house signatures are not only long distance travel right so a lot of it is actually getting into that anciently it was called what the house of god that idea of higher study of the house of spirit um and for me that's what this year has been about like i'm sitting in the same place looking at the sky every night and kind of tracking these happenings and that's um that's this bit about the hand on the the, the sun on the hand of the high man i'll just say that the sun does pass on orion's club like every year forever the ecliptic goes right through there and that by the way in that image of washington that's um that's that rainbow it's where the ecliptic intersects the milky way so what's unique in our time and it's not just today and it wasn't just 2012 it's kind of like a 50-year window i i use 1975 to 2025 um it was actually more centered around 1999. It's this idea some have called the galactic alignment. And there's a really wonderful book by that title by the great John Major Jenkins, who spent most of his latter years in Colorado as well. He's a great teacher and sadly he transitioned a couple years ago under much duress because people just really attacked him for what he was saying and what he was revealing, which I just, it's so hard to understand. He's a beautiful man. But there's a book called, um, Galactic Alignment by John Major Jenkins, highly recommended for any astrologer and any mystic, where he's tuning you into the prophecies of many lands and showing you how the Maya and other civilizations were pointing to our time when, he doesn't describe it this way, but when the, the, the South Galactic Cross would be aligned with zero degrees tropical Capricorn. Like that's what's happening now. And, and again, what it is, it's Earth's South Pole is pointing to the galactic cross in space. And on the other side, and this is the one that I've tuned into, like North, because there's this thing like a lot of people quote when they speak about the turning of the ages doctrine, like Jesus saying, you know, go into the city, find the man bearing the pitcher of water, follow him into the house in which he dwells. When he was asked by the disciples, like mm -hmm. where the last supper, or, well, they didn't know it was the last supper, like where Passover supper would be, right? And it seems to be speaking about the sign of Aquarius, right? Or the age of Aquarius. But on the next page, he's on trial and they're getting him to blasphemy publicly. And he says, he's like, yeah, did you say this? Did you say you were the son of the beloved? And he's like, yeah, I am. And you <laughs> will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven and sitting at the right hand of the mighty one. So anyone who's engaged with the sky away from bright city lights knows the clouds of heavens is the Milky Way. Because you'll be out there some nights and it's like, oh, it's some weird clouds. Are. It's like, oh my God, that's not clouds. Like, that's our galaxy? What? You know, when you first have that breakthrough, it's like you know, crazy. <laughs> and then the right hand of the mighty one is this place that Orion's Club points to, which is the center of this sacred hoop. And the Lakota are not the only ones that say, like, this is kind of the place where we come from and go back through. It's a really powerful once in 26,000 year alignment that's not just one year, but basically the height of the light from the Northern Hemisphere, like Jerusalem, the glory of the King, if you will, has been aligned to that place for some decades now. And there are powerful acupuncture points that were solar eclipses on the solstice, on the hand of the high man in the sacred hoop that happened in 1982 
and that will happen this year of 2020. And that happened on June solstice 2001. And so mm-hmm. I'm sure that energetically the whole 9-11 happening was an expression of that alignment, but it's not meant to be painful and all this shit, even though of course we're experiencing a lot of that right now here in 2020, but I feel like this is a breakthrough. I feel like it's a time for us to get ourselves back consciously on track. And if we look at themes and amazingly the eclipse cycles are following the same dance choreography. I mean, this is where it's like such a beautiful thing to have expertise as a dancer like you do too, because these polyrhythms, right? Like when we look at the Saturn Pluto cycle, which can be anywhere between 33 and 38 years, it just so happens to be completely synchronized to these eclipse cycles, right? And when we look at Jupiter, Pluto and Jupiter, Saturn, like there is something that is bringing us into engagement with this 1981, 82, like seed I'll say, and 19 or 2001, maybe sprout. And now this time where I think the flower is willing to form if we're willing to like do some gardening instead of be gardened. Yeah. So I have, um, one of the people is asking and they said they like listening to us. So that's nice. So good job, Brett. Uh, the question is, this makes sense, but makes me nervous. Is this a good thing? Yeah, right. So that's such a great question always that we face in our work. And I think it's, um, I mean, Stormy, you, <laughs> you must have that same experience, right? Sure. Like, oh, yeah. Which yeah, is I mean, a hard question to answer sometimes, right? Is this, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Well, I think it becomes a challenge for me sometimes to answer that because I don't see a big line of those two things, good thing, bad thing, right? Like maybe you need the heavy thing in order to shift and to walk forward, right? And if you never get it, that's the real trauma or the real tragedy, right? So is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I think as we're looking at it, as you're just talking, the thing I'm thinking about is it's a thing. It is just the next <laughs> no, it's a thing, thing. Oh, yeah. forward, right? It's a big thing. It's a big time for us. It's significant. But if you're just walking around trying to figure out, do I continue with this job? What do I do? And some basic real life questions, right? If you just got boots on the ground there and these energies are happening and coming through and we are going back to something, I would interpret it as the thing that will ask you what's home. What is I love that. Home? Right. Yeah. To bring in that, that cancer thing and see like it is home again, because like our entire wheel is tied to this place. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, to answer, is this a good or bad thing? We have to define what is good and what is bad. And that's going to take a lot longer than an hour. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's going to be different for other people, but you brought up a really good example in that flow stormy, right? Which is, do I change job? Do I keep this job? Right? So that's something that we hear often in our profession. And I'm, I'm usually leaning towards no, because you're asking me because you don't dig it. Right? Yeah, absolutely. But, I'm like, probably not. You're on your right? way out. So like, <laughs> that's what this time is. You know, if it's, do I stay here or do I go there? It's what feels better. And you're like, well, right now it's interesting because I'm not allowed to go somewhere, but we have to ask, is that the way? And I think, most importantly this is a time where we are being reminded that we are the dreamers and um, there's something in this time where it feels very saturnian where we've been put in place to say like, look at who you are look at what you've done look at where you're going as, as a person as a civilization as a culture as a family all that stuff you know mm-hmm. and it's time to say this is who i am yep. and this is how it's going to be And to say that with like joy and, and, but strength in your heart, you know? And I think this is a time where we are, I mean, they say that like, you can look at these different avatars through the ages. And many have said, you know, that we are, are each individually the avatar for the new age, whether you call it Christ consciousness or whatever it wants to be. I kind of like allowed myself to peacefully go to sleep on the idea that the whole world is going to quote unquote awaken in a moment. Cause I had like some dreams of that with the 2012 bit. Um, and then I realized that that's not how it's supposed to go. Right? Sure. 
but everyone is allowed to really grow and to say one more thing about your flow there it's like i think we can we get to a place in our own lives where we look back and we say wow that worst thing ever was the best thing ever mm -hmm. and then we get to another place too where it's like oh wow because i've become aware of that i've now been manifesting challenging and like hardships because i have proven that i grow through them and then there's another level of what if i just choose to stay engaged mm -hmm. and ask why me even when things feel light and beautiful and as long as i choose to grow from the energies that are around that's the energies that i call forth as my curriculum in life yeah and like for me these are like the coming of age, the coming of the ages, if you will, like awarenesses that are being made to the human experience has been lost for a long time. But we have to get ourselves out of this is happening to me consciousness, right? So we can like happen through it. Yeah, I agree. And I genuinely believe and this is what we talked about my portion on the panel too um with astrology hub is that i think saturn's a little bit he's put it back on us he's handed it back he's like it's been a couple years we've worked on these areas now what you have is because it's what you've chosen and if you'd like something else i'm willing to do that too but to be able to have the strength of heart like you said and the strength of character at this point to see it and for each of us to go, I am inflicting myself on this job I don't want, <laughs> mm. but I don't know where to go next. The I don't know where to go next is right where you're going, right? And Saturn, I think, has, has raised all of us in some way, however efficiently that has happened, into that place of some active responsibility, which is so brilliant. I think it's exciting. Now it is not exciting always to get there. It's a bit rough. The growing up process is a heavy energy, but it's neat right here. And it's neat, I think, in the um, Uranian vibe we've got going to travel it together. Because mm -hmm. I can watch you grow up and see the positive aspects and help you keep going. And you can do that back for me, right? But the fact Ooh. is, we've all got to choose what's the next home that we're willing to build the rest of the foundation of our lives on here for whatever the cycle is for for that time you know so yeah, i think it's kind of cool even in these like really significant challenges like personally economically like blessings to people who have lost their job and are like terrified maybe even for the first times in their lives of how they're going to put food on the plate sure. their children i mean this is like you know, and those waves, those shock waves are going to be hitting harder and harder, I think. And to, to be like solid in the midst of that storm and to like not run away from the tidal wave, but find a way to dive through it, to find like the peaceful waters on the other side, that is the challenge. And we are all experiencing this in a very different way. Like, sure. you know, I'm blessed that I've been, clients I've been working consistently with, they're like, dude, thank God that I decided to completely change my job three years ago in that trauma that you like, we were talking about that together because mm -hmm. now I can do this thing in this world where my right. last thing, like there's no way. And I mean, that's like, a, I'm sure you're having that too, Storm, like a very common experience right now. People who have been resisting the change that their soul has been calling for, or now it's like, it's accelerating, it's advancing. Because <laughs> you're stuck. We're in it. And they're like, literally, you might not leave your house and go back to your job. What are you going to do? Right. What are you going to do? And the truth is, like, there is something that you love that you have to share where you can receive abundance and you know it. And now is the time to have faith that even though that completely defies the, you know, acceptable idea of what it is to be productive in society, like, yeah. that's your thing. That's your dream. And you're being reminded. And you know what I'm talking about, everyone who's listening, I think. And many people will just say, well, what is my dream? And that's a bit of it, too, right? As we've become really disconnected from listening mm -hmm. to that one in us that is so excited and so passionate because you know we've been trained to like quiet that voice and this is yeah. a time actually where in our stillness just like as we were speaking about earlier like building that the stack of stones like that symbolic language which rides on the waves of your inner passion 
are willing to find you in this moment now if somehow in this time where we're being forced to slow down many many are actually trying to speed up to try to regulate and we need to release that thing too right i'm definitely guilty there so oh, yeah sure who hasn't had to shift i was like oh i'll just do all of these interviews on tuesday like all 48 of them right and i'm like okay <laughs> that's unrealistic right everybody has had to like step back in in some way and kind of reground to see what is but i love that a reconnection to what is my passion because you can astrology all you want if you won't sit with yourself and listen, I think we miss it. Mm. We miss it and we don't reconnect with what do I love and what am I built for? Yeah. And what is like, what am I actually experiencing versus what am I telling myself I should experience and when I should experience, which of course is a danger of astrology. But that being said, I really want to ask you an astrology question. Um, the other thing to like, synchronized with that that sharing of your experience you know, like i mean i was supposed to be teaching in this course that i'm teaching for opa at zion national park and it was a four-day intensive and i was prepared to like be in the flow and teach and go here and there and now it's like being created as a video course where i'm going to get very like particular but that's meant a lot of sleepless nights and like a lot of work right and um and then just my idea of how much i can do versus how much I should do. Because the more I take myself away from this moment, the less I can receive the directions that will help steer that thing very clearly, you know? And that's, I think, a, the principal lesson for each of us individually and for us as a culture. Now we do see some, we do see some, you know, potential married to the, the poison of this time, which is like the earth is healing as people are shut down and that should be an inspiration, right? That's, we can look around right now and say, oh, wow, those ones that told me that I am such a bad industrial human that I've taken my planet beyond the point of no return. Um, actually, that's not true. And that doesn't mean we should all go out and like buy a bigger SUV and see if we can, you know, destroy the earth faster. It means, look, she can recover and quicker than we thought and so let's start dreaming forth a paradigm where she's allowed to recover and, and be a natural as a planet without us hiding inside, but with us outside dancing on her green hills, you know? Like the same as what we're saying for the individual, don't you think? Absolutely. You got kicked out of your job, your whatever the circumstances, you can recover quicker than you thought and still go outside. Yeah, and it's amazing when we are, I mean, I've been that person, I am that person, or I'm shifting from having dropped out of school to chase my saxophone around the world with a band for many, many years. I decided, actually, I'm like, I'm better at math than that stuff. And I went and got an engineering degree, and for, fortunately, I like burned out on that just, just around graduation time and graduated with that degree and found a job I didn't care, but like, synchronistic things finally led me to, to releasing the blocks that kept me from honoring spirit and then astrology just poured in and looking back i can realize oh this is where i was meant to be but i would have never guessed you know how that is and, oh, that, yeah. and so many people are having that experience it's like wow i had to just go through this these initiations and release the attempt to understand what it was about so that i could you know and that thing's accelerating so you said, I think, something really important earlier, Stormy, which was that um, Saturn saying, look, we've been doing this, you know, Saturn through Capricorn is what I heard, you know, we, we've been tuning into this for a couple of years, and, and now we're getting ready. And, and so I wanted to ask you this question when you said that, um, do you feel that Saturn's retrograde that's going to be happening for four, four and a half months as he does, bringing it back to Capricorn is kind of just a little bit of review there? And then once Saturn returns to Aquarius, kind of full stop, that will be part of the timings of the shift coming ahead? Or how do you yeah. feel retrograde speaks? Yeah, well, I like retrogrades personally. I think we should all make friends with them. But definitely, when I look at it in the um, personal space, well, really, and even in, in the mundane space as well, I do think it is the review to crystallize some lessons that maybe we were being pointed out about structures within ourselves, within our own lives, out in the world, all of these things. And we'll get to step back and review them because my take is that as soon as Saturn 
stepped out of Capricorn and moved into Aquarius, we got a sneak peek. We immediately got to see all the things we don't know and we don't know how to do and we better figure it out, right? It's like, hey, we're going right here. And, you know, my favorite example right now is Zoom is zoom oh my god they thought they had built this just magical platform they're like this is the best thing since bread yay and saturn came into aquarius and they got so much more users usership to their platform that it pointed out problems they didn't even think to think about having and they immediately went oh my god we've got to fix it and so i'm watching them and they have become aware of all of the problems that they could not have identified without the push of all these people. And now over the next four months, as this retrograde happens, they will crystallize this system and get it real tight and real set. And as we come back through Saturn and Aquarius, I think Zoom will be pretty hot stuff. I think there will be something hard to compete with and I think they'll really make their space solid. But I think that the individual is like that as well, right? Sure. What's that? Yeah, I mean, the conspiracy theorists might even think that this whole thing was staged by Zoom because, you know, it's the most happening platform. Oh, hell, like, that's but, just, like, another level. I'm, like, so unprepared for it. Do you know what I mean? I'm right, like, but and I'm just playing around. But, I mean, they also <laughs> did get hacked, but it's a really beautiful expression, like you said. Like, well, how does that relate to your own story? Because we've all yeah. been hacked. We've all been suddenly the announcement of a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't that we weren't prepared for and the mm -hmm. whole point of it is to prepare us right, right. i mean the simple example in, in my life is like on and i just planted a, a food garden and it's something i've been saying i would do for years and years and just like never put the energy in and now it was like oh no you better build your arm a garden you know and so <laughs> it's happening and we're both really i mean especially on is really thriving out there and mothering you know plant babies and it's just like so wonderful to see and so beautiful that it's like well why can we just like it's you just grow your food you just do that you know what i mean it's like to become more human through these challenges um that really seem to challenge our humanity like that's what this is about you know yeah. um i've been watching jupiter and saturn for years now i got tuned into astrology in 2012 and basically since that time i had a huge awakening by jupiter in december of 2012 and i've just been watching you know jupiter and saturn dancing through the sky since that time and saturn was here and jupiter was there and then you know and they're doing these retrograde things and they're getting closer and closer yeah. and now if you wake up before the sun and you look southeast they are like this and I've been watching that dance, you know, and now there's slow down and Jupiter's not catching up and they'll back up and go back into Capricorn. And, you know, speaking of like, as you said, like we have to make friends with retrogrades. I, I think this is a really interesting example of a potential disconnect between astrology and astronomy. Like, I think the rational mind really fears the things that it can't figure out. And, um, when the astronomers just could not come to terms in any way and no mathematical system they created worked to describe why planets retrograde in a geocentric or Earth-centered cosmology, I think it really introduced a lot of superstition around retrograde motion. And with the heliocentric, you know, breakthrough revolution, like it's really easy to describe why Jupiter retrogrades now. It's simply because Earth is passing Jupiter by and we see it Sure. And we used to see it all the time when you pass a car on the highway. You know you're both going forward, but one looks like it's going backwards because you're faster than it. And that's the truth with Earth Jupiter and or Earth Saturn, which is coming up. But I think importantly, that doesn't mean that it's not different. In fact, it's very important to say in that example, like the reason why Jupiter is stationing retrograde, the reason why Saturn is stationing retrograde, if Pluto who we can't see, but is because Earth is starting to pass them by. And that means that Earth will be closest to Jupiter in our annual orbit. Or for Jupiter, it's really a 399-day dance. And for Saturn, a 378-day dance. Like, we are getting closest to them. Yeah. And so any information Jupiter or Saturn might wish to impart, mm -hmm. perhaps it's easier to get it through to us if they're right next, you know, as close as they get. And so... I think there's something really important in, in making friends with the retrogrades, as you say, is it's like, look, I have an opportunity to connect more personally with these 
beings because they're right they're right here right you can't say with jupiter saturn like astronomically speaking and yet they're closer than ever sure. and so i i really feel that these retrogrades and they always speak so much they always like remind us of the beauty like if the dancer only moved forward like they'd just be out of our frame too quickly right. you know, there's something about them like flowing back in the other direction and, yeah. and to experience that in the sky and to watch and I, and I just can't recommend i think maybe to to finish up similar to where we started like folks wake up right now before the sun and look to the southeast and you will see a bright beaming planet looking back at you and that's Jupiter and then just look right to the east from there. So those of you in the northern hemisphere, that will be to your left. And if you're southern hemisphere, that'll be to your right. And watch them dance for the coming months. They will conjoin in December. You will see that they're available at a different hour of the morning as you move and they will teach you so much about how the sky works and it's simply going out there and instead of telling them who they are and what they do just listening and asking them to teach you and together Jupiter and Saturn are amazing professors of a 20-year curriculum that's about to reach a stage of matriculation and whether we've been consciously participating or not we have been participating and a great shift is upon us so I'm very excited about it personally. Yeah, I think it's a good time. I think it's a great time. And I think it's a significant time to all be in it together, right? To kind of welcome each other to the table of life right now with our teacups. I'll drink to that. All right. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Actually, I'll drink from the Mercury cup. My guy just ingressed Gemini today. So that's right. Oh, yeah. Gemini, where is your Mercury? Libra can join Pluto in the fifth. I have Gemini rising. Um, yeah, so Mercury is right with Porama, which is the shoulder of the priestess in the heavens, and, and a line in the, like that kind of zone and with the crow. So, yeah, 12, 13th degree Libra, pretty close to Pluto and opposite Aries, Jupiter, and all sorts of other things. What about you? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, my Mercury is in Gemini. So, pretty pumped about that whole story right yeah, I like when's your solar return uh well i just had my birthday so it was mine was the fourth so my return was actually on the third got you so mercury's evening star for you let me tell you it's at the tip top of my chart too so i was always going to come out here and talk to all your and i am in a are third house rising? perfection year what's that are you virgo, virgo rising I am a Virgo rising. So gotcha. it's a miracle that I make any content. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. So, yeah. <laughs> For me, it's Sun Square Saturn with Virgo Venus right at the midpoint of that square. It is hard to like relax the one in me who needs the art to be perfect so I can actually. Oh, you do hear my like, call. <laughs> facing like this close to my consciousness my awareness right now it's one of like i think the kind of very loud shouting of spirit during this shelter in, in place weird time that we're living so yeah well and it's interesting i think about it too because my mercury is square my ascending so you know and so I just, just think about the experience of the last two years, which was really getting solid, especially um, getting solid and getting ready to come out here is what it felt like. Even though I've been doing the job for a long time, but getting solid and getting ready to come out and kind of join my fellows. And here I am. I've just begun a, a Pluto perfection year. I'm like, let's do it. Let's go communicate our, our little butts off. Hmm. We'll go scoop up all these people. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm glad to have been scooped. It's really <laughs> nice to connect with you, Stormy. Yes, you as well. And thank you for coming in and talking to us. People are loving us in the comments. So I'm sure I'll have to have you back. We'll talk about something else. This has just been freaking amazing. Right on. And again, for like the esoteric stuff I was getting into today, y'all check out my talk at Norwalk coming up. It's called The Sun on the Cross. Um, there's also a long movie at GeminiBrett.com um, called 
2020 revelations where I start at Chartres Cathedral and we get into the Capitol building and I'll reference in that film if you choose to put in some time. I don't know if you have any extra time on your hands right now. <laughs> um, also another long movie on my website that's called Washington Deciphered, The Star Mysteries of DC. Um, and they're both kind of tuned into the same story that the sky has been telling me unfortunately because my eyes were opened by daniel jamario of the shamanic astrology mystery mm -hmm. school who's very much a, a sky guy and a man after my own heart like sacred sites and you know the most important temple we could possibly walk on is called earth you know and the ceiling is the amazingly dynamic heaven so i hope that um this chat today has confirmed what you have always known is hopefully maybe opened more interest in getting outside and just allowing whatever starlight shines in your eye to speak to you directly. Yeah. Thanks for coming over, Brett. You guys, we love you. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.